Lecture number seven, uh, entitled The Selection of Phases, Poles, Stator, and Rotor Slots for, uh, for a selection for use in designing three types of electrical machines. The selection number phases, of course, is always the first decision, and it's uh, not a big decision. It's usually three phases. Uh, most inverter-fed machines that are used around the world today are three-phase motors, particularly grid motors. Uh, because of that, IGBT manufacturers and MOSFET manufacturers are transistor people. They uh, package their transistor bridges in sets of six for three-phase drives. It's not uncommon to use uh, two three-phase circuits and two bridges or even three bridges and three three-phase circuits in, in a machine. Uh, it's useful for fault, this is useful for fault tolerance and it's also useful for uh, uh, reducing the cost of the electronics or, or uh, there's some other benefits of using multiple uh, bridges. Uh, large machines, like generators used in power plants, frequently use more than one three-phase circuit. Stepping motors use two, three, and four. There's e there are even five-phase step motors. Uh, switch reluctance machines use two, three, four, five, and six-phase stators. Uh, the two-phase stator is a, is a very popular one for vacuum cleaners and fans and things of that sort. Very famous vacuum cleaner. Uh, uses a two-phase uh, switch electrons motor that goes 100,000 RPM. But these electrons are all based on uh, stators that uh, use three phases or multiples of three phases. Uh, the, uh, this is, some of this is repeated from the last slide, but there's more details on this one. Uh, now for permanent magnet generators, it's not uncommon to have a single phase or a two phase. It's not necessary to have a three phase if you're going to rectify the output anyway and use capacitors to smooth out the the uh, variation in the in the voltage to make it a smooth DC. Uh, one one of the uh, advantages of no, uh, increasing the number of poles is you in, you improve the torque density. We'll show that in a subsequent climb a slide. Uh, but the, the downside of increasing the number of poles is that the, the iron losses in, this, in the uh, yolks and teeth goes up because of the increased frequency. And also with the increased number of poles, uh, the transistor losses uh, will increase. But uh, uh, in terms of torque density, uh, it's better to have a high number of poles. The, uh, the relationship of the number of slots to the number of poles is is an in, is a uh, is another story entirely. There's uh, there's two types of combinations. There's the integral slot windings. That's where the number of poles dis divides evenly in the number of stator slots with no with no uh, uh, remainder. Fractional slot winding is where the number of rotor poles does not divide equally into the number of stator slots, so there's a remainder. But these, frac these are called fractional slot combinations, and one of the advantages of those is that they yield lower cogging torques if it's a permanent magnet motor. The ratio of the slots to pole numbers determines the winding choice options for all kinds of, uh, all three of the motor types that... Uh, we're talking about here that use the same stator. Uh, the, uh, so, sometimes with certain designs, one of the most important elements in the whole design is to make the end turns short. Uh, if, if you must use a radial flux motor and you have a very minimum axial space to put it in, you've got to keep these end turns low. So your, your best choice in that case is to use a fractional slot winding, a pole and slot combination where the coils are wrapped around a single tooth so that the end turns are real short. But having said all those things, there are for, to have balanced three-phase windings or six-phase or any windings as far as that goes, there are only certain combinations of poles and slots that uh, that will work. And the determination of those is uh, can be very tedious. Many engineers just copy what, what's been done by others rather than uh, completely understand how you determine that uh, for your particular instance. 
Uh, there is a famous book written on this subject. It was originally in German back in the early part of the last century, uh, enti uh, entitled Motor Windings or something like that. And the author was a, is a very famous uh, professor from the University of Berlin. L Lucius Garrick was his name. And uh, I, he's a man with two last names. I believe his first name was Michael. Lucius Garrick, uh, back in the 30s, he took on his wife's name, maiden name as well as his. And when he immigrated to America and taught at, uh, Worc uh, at uh, Brooklyn Polytech, he uh, translated this book into English and it is available. And so he uh, lists all the winding possibilities that there are and the formulas and the uh, methods to determine them and uh, list diagrams of them in this book. It's, it's a shame that uh, American uh, 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 patent examiners don't have access to this book because the U.S. Patent Office has issued a number of patents on winding and pole combinations that are covered by the principles in that book, which would make, uh, uh, make them not unique inventions, uh, but, the, but the prior art's well documented in that book. Um, but uh, if you use multiple three-phase circuits in a stator, then that further limits the, your choices of slot uh, windings for the for given slot and pole combinations. The, the ideal winding distribution factor is unity, and we're going to talk more about that. To, to utilize all the conductors in the machine, we should, we should uh, strive for as high a winding distribution factor as possible, and we'll study more about that in a moment. Let's, uh, let's summarize some uh, slot to pole selection guidelines, and this applies to all three of these machines. Uh, as we said before, higher pole numbers yield higher torque densities and, and, and higher power densities to some degree, but, but the easiest way to increase the power density is to double the speed. If you double the speed of a motor, you have double the power density because power is torque times speed. But uh, uh, the, some, some of the, uh, uh, the issues relating what happens when you change the number of poles. Well, if you double the number of poles, the yoke or the back iron is cut in half. Now, so so what that means is if you use less steel in the, if you if you use a thinner cross section in the in the yoke of a stator, there's a couple things you could do with that. You can make the row, you keep the stator OD the same and make the uh, slot depth the same in the stator and make the rotor larger. Or your other choice is to is whatever you reduce the thickness of the yoke by increasing the number of poles, you take that off of the OD. And so you make the OD of the motor smaller. It depends what, uh, which is the most important. You're going to get the same flux. The, uh, the flux you get is independent of the number of poles. And a lot of people fail to realize that, but remember that, that that's absolute truth that the, uh, uh, assuming no leakage, there is a uh, caveat in that statement in that the higher the number of poles, the higher the leakage from the leakage reactants goes up with, an, with increased number of poles. But other than that problem, uh, uh, you don't uh, gain anything by increasing or lose it much by changing the number of poles other than uh, you, use, you need less steel, you need less yoke in the, in the machine. Uh, so uh, one one of the things that uh, we must remember that uh, uh, when when you're playing around with the number of poles, you you have to deal with the uh, with uh, the the effects of the change in frequency. And uh, if you double the number of poles, you double the commutation frequency. Now now we're we're going to study this uh, later, but. Uh, it's uh, pretty well accepted amongst inverter designers that, uh, for, uh, that, that to produce a decent sine wave, they need about 20 PWM uh, chops per sine wave cycle. So that uh, they're, if, if they're limited on the PWM frequency due to the losses that are acceptable in the IGBT bridge, then uh, this can have something to do with the decision of how many poles you pick. Uh, for example, if I'm designing a machine in my consulting, one of the first things that I have to ask is whoever's going to do the inverter, someone's going to design one from scratch, or they're going to purchase a standard one, what's the maximum uh, 
uh, number of poles they can stand with whatever PWM frequency they're allowed to use uh, for, core lo for transistor losses. So, uh, so the PWM frequency has a lot to do with the number of poles as well. Uh, uh, the state of slot selection guidelines, uh, first of all, uh, as we said, uh, you want the highest winding factor. So if possible, uh, integral slot windings give you the highest winding factor. If the number of, of uh, the, uh, if the slots per pole per phase is a whole number with no remainder after you divide the, the phases and the uh, number of poles out, then you have unity uh, uh, distribution factor. Now, fractional slot windings lead, lead to short end windings. That can be a big benefit. And uh, fractional slot stators are very automation friendly. That's another important consideration and is low cost to make. Uh, multiple slot uh, span, coil spans, which are required for integral slot windings, that, that requires very expensive insertion equipment, that, but, but uh, that it's standard induction equipment. There's a lot of it around, but uh, uh, if you're starting out with a new motor design, you don't have that equipment, why then uh, these integral slot winding with multiple tooth uh, coil spans, you either have to hand insert the coils, which is labor intensive, or you have to uh, use very expensive automation equipment. Um, now, for induction motors uh, there, and reluctant synchronous and PM, there's, there's, there's a few factors that are different from one machine to the other. The, the comments made before aren't universally applicable to all these machines. They are applicable to uh, the PM machine, but the induction, the induction machine and the reluctant synchronous machine the the issues related to to the number of poles with those machines it follows the same guidelines uh, it's been pretty well proven that uh, for any induction motor uh, under that has an output of under 1300 newton meters that a four pole is a very good choice because if you go to higher poles than that the efficiency and power factor drops considerably because of the leakage reactants and the synchronous reactants and all the reactances uh, are affected by higher pole numbers as the machine uh, in, in, you know in smaller machines so the same thing applies uh, to reluctant synchronous machines here's a here's a uh, uh, a nice slide that was uh, developed by professor song from uh, a university in australia and uh, he, he shows here what you can do with, uh, with, uh, with, with changing the rotor arm. This, uh, this first example here shows, shows different values of the slot uh, depth ratio. This is uh, what you can do. You keep the, the stator OD is kept the same in all three of these. The stator OD is kept the same. But the, but the rotor diameter has gotten bigger so that the ratio of the slot depth has has changed so that's uh, one variation in uh, uh, that uh, you can consider when comparing and optimizing your design Th this one this other one here is probably more important here here we have the case of keeping the rotor diameter the same and changing the number of poles and we've kept the slot depth the same and you can see how with a two pole machine the stator is this diameter Changing that to four pole, the stator yoke's cut in half. Changes to eight yoke, the stator is cut in half again. So the eight pole machine has much higher torque density than the two pole machine. And consequently, you can look at this and a coil for a two pole machine is going to have to be wound from here to here, all the way. So you've got this huge amount of copper in the end turns, which makes the end turns long. With a four pole machine, the coil is wound 90 degrees, it goes from here to here. So there's much less, there's really the same amount of copper in the, in the uh, there's the same cross section of copper, but the strands are longer. Or they, so I'll say it the other way, as you increase the number of poles, the, the, the cross section of copper is the same into the, into the paper. But uh, the, since the length is longer, you require more ex end turn extension out the ends. 
uh, it goes down with four pole and, and an eight pole it only spans uh, 45 degrees the coils are real short you see this is a a, a picture of a of a uh, summary chart that was uh, done by these uh, by this uh, this guy that worked for uh, Reliance Electric a number of years ago. They they Reliance uh, was uh, considering the the future of their business, and so they uh, did a technical analysis of their existing line of induction machines and how they might apply these. Uh, for use with inverters. Remember, all their historical machines, as was the case with every motor company, was designed for grid power, constant frequency and voltage. But to, to use these machines for uh, inverters where you could vary the frequency and the voltage, what? how does that affect the number of poles? So they did this big study and concluded that, that uh, uh, the uh, the, the number of poles was optimized at four for machines of a thousand foot pounds or under. And uh, if, if you uh, go to six pole, six pole machines, you can, uh, you're, you're, uh, you're very limited as to uh, uh, the, uh, the torque rating of those motors. If, if Really what it boils down to, it has a lot to do with the cord length on the surface of the rotor. You can use higher pole motors if the, uh, if the rotor's bigger. If, for real large motors, you can have high, high pole count induction motors, but not for uh, s smaller ones that would be uh, uh, under 1,000 foot-pounds. Uh, but uh, if you go up to 10,000 foot-pounds, you, you can use uh, uh, six-pole motors or even higher, six- or eight-pole motors between 1,000 foot-pounds and 10,000 foot-pounds. And that has to do with the fact that on those larger torque motors, the rotor is going to be bigger, so the cord length is, is bigger. It's a matter of the, the leakage, the percentage of the pole flux, as, as how much of that percent leaks to the next pole leakage reactants. So, uh, so uh, for PM and uh, PM brushless, whether they're DC uh, six-step or whether they're uh, AC driven, uh, you, you, if, if your speed, it's all based on speed. If, you're, if the motor's going to go 100,000 RPM or higher, or, or, or frankly anything higher than 50,000 RPM, you have to use a two-pole machine because uh, it's just... Uh, the frequencies are just too high for the inverter. And of course, that would be true. For, this is true for an induction motor, too, or a reluctant synchronous motor, high speed when you have to go to two pole. But uh, uh, with the PM machines, uh, you can go up to 50,000 RPM with four poles. You can go up to 25,000 RPM to 10 to 8 or 10 poles. And 12 poles or higher would be low speed under 1,000 RPM for. Uh, uh, for applications such as torquers. And just to summarize the advantages of increasing the number of poles on a PM machine, you, you, uh, you, result, you get a reduction in the active material cross-sections, including the soft iron, the stator cores, the iron cores, and the magnet thickness is reduced with the number of poles. So, so that uh, saves money, doesn't it? Higher pole numbers reduces magnet costs. We see it right there. Rotor diameter can be larger with the same stator diameter. Stator diameter can be smaller with the same rotor. Reduction of phase in resistance improves efficiency and results in shorter end turns. But the disadvantages of higher pole numbers is the, f the flux leakage, pole flux leakage, varies directly with the pole pair number. Iron losses increase with higher pole pair numbers and higher uh, PWM frequencies are required, which uh, which uh, affects the inverter. Here's a uh, an example of, of of the end turn resistance versus the number of uh, poles. You could see that the percent of the stator resistance, in terms of uh, uh, no, the percent of the end turn resistance as a percentage of the total phase resistances. You can see how that is it's it's quite high for a two pole machine. It's uh, it's uh, 
half to 75 percent of the total resistance of the phase windings are in the interns. That means that uh, uh, all that copper is uh, is eating up voltage. It's creating heat, but it's not producing torque. The only parts of the conductors in the phase winding that produce torque are the ones that are down the slots that link with the flux from the rotor. And as you could see, that percentage drops to 40 to 55 percent for an eight pole motor. Uh, the uh, RSM switch the synchronous reluctant synchronous machines. My best advice is to start with a, an existing standard four pole induction motor stator. And many of the pros and cons that relate to PM machines apply to the RSM as well. The most important uh, aspect of uh, an RS machine is the design of the rotor, and the, and the goal is to get as high inductance ratio as possible between the D axis and the Q axis as it lines with the stator phase windings. So that means that you have to create flux barriers and, and leave some flux carriers in there and have the proportions such that, uh, that, that you can get these uh, inductance ratios uh, over 5, uh, 8 to 10 preferred or higher if possible. And, uh, the, the maximum pole number that, that is allowed is similar to the induction motor, not because of leakage, but because of the ability to produce a high in inductance ratio. So that uh, uh, it's, you, you need a certain uh, arc or a length, a, a, a circumference arc uh, between the L and D, or the Q and D axis to be able to get a decent inductance ratio. Uh, Typical designs tend to have pole numbers equal to, to AC of the same AC induction of the same capacity. Uh, the, first of all, the, you, the number of stator slots must be divisible evenly by the number of phases with no remainder. That's absolutely essential. Uh, and so, and as we said, there's a limited list of slot and pole combinations. I'm going to provide you with a list. For each one of those combinations, there's uh, there's frequently a multiple number of coil location possibilities, and each one results in a different winding distribution factor. And the most desirable and the maximum, of course, is one. So you always want to select the 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 winding uh, or the coil location pattern for any given uh, number of slots versus poles to give you the highest distribution factor. Uh, the uh, so so what that means is in terms of uh, since since the the number of stator slots has to be divisible the number of phases for three phase motors your choice are three six nine twelve fifteen eighteen twenty one twenty four twenty seven thirty thirty three and so on and since the uh, phase windings must be balanced all the slots need to be filled should be filled with the same number of conductors. Or uh, you should have the turns per slot or conductors per slot the same. When I say conductors, I mean conductors of each slide of the, each side of the number of turns of a coil. Not I'm not talking about parallel. Uh, you you want to have uh, all the slots full of, of copper just for ohmic losses. But when I say conductors, I mean uh, conductors is number of turns times two. Conductors equals number of turns times two. And so each phase for a three-phase motor has to, the coils have to be distributed 120 electrical degrees apart. Um, so uh, so a, a fractional slot winding uh, usually has uh, the coils spanning a single tooth or, or maybe two teeth or maybe uh, even more, you, a fractional slot winding can even have a coil spanning more than two teeth. You you might have cases where one pole has uh, has uh, one coil per pole per phase, and another pole might have two coils f for that pole. But that two coil pole has to uh, be 120 degrees apart for every phase for it to be balanced. That would, a case of that would be a four-pole, 15-slot motor. 
as opposed to a four-pole 12 slot motor. A uh, four-pole 12 slot motor is an integral slot winding. A four-pole 15 slot motor is a fractional slot winding by definition. But uh, you could still have a balanced winding as long as the uh, each phase is unbalanced in, in and of itself. But as long as you have the unbalance of each phase balanced around the the circumference of the stator and their uh, in 120 degrees apart in case of three phase, 90 degrees apart in case of four phase, then you still wind up with a balanced uh, winding. Uh, the number, the symbol for number slots is used S in the United States and Q in Europe, just for your edification. Now, the uh, there's a, here's an ISBN book here that lists uh, all the possible uh, slot and pole combinations for different number of pole uh, phases, and that's provided in Chapter Three. But based on a few simple rules. Uh, of slot and pole choices that cannot provide balanced windings are provided on the next slide. The uh, the number of stator slots must be divisible by the number of phases, which we said with no z with no remainder. And uh, for the number of phases, the 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 to have balanced windings, the phases. The sets of phase coils must be spaced around the stator according to this. We already said that the three phase is, is, has to be spaced 120 degrees apart. Well, two phase is 180, four phase is 90, five phase 72, six phase 60. So here's a, uh, a, a imp uh, rather than give you a list of possible winding patterns, here's a list of the impossible winding patterns. In other words, uh, these uh, uh, you can't have uh, six slots and, and six poles. You can't have uh, 12 slots and, and, and uh, uh, six poles. These, these are the ones that aren't possible. I gave you a reference of a book that gives you the ones that are. So, so any slot and pole combination you come up with, you look it up in this list. If it's, if it's here, it won't work. Now, for induction motor, the rotor bar selection number is a totally different topic. It's a totally different subject because uh, it's true that the current flowing in the rotor bars determines the, the, uh, uh, the, the poles that are induced in the rotor. That's true. So I guess you could say that for a four-pole motor, the minimum number of bars in a four-pole motor would be four bars, but you would never... You, you would never design a machine like that because you have too much current in that in each one of those bars so so you have a, a lot of bars provide the current flow that produces each pole so that uh, uh, and different motor design experts down through the years have have come up with a sets of rules on how to pick the number of bars with respect to the number of uh, stator slots but most of these rules were all uh, determined from experience of trying to start induction motors at a fixed frequency and voltage off the grid. That's where all those rules came from. And they're, they're particularly stringent and difficult for single phase motors because uh, uh, some combinations just are just terrible and it won't work. The motor won't even start with certain bar combinations. But that, that whole subject, that whole topic tends to, to be mitigated and go away, as it were, uh, if, you, if you could control frequency and voltage separately. So it, it's not so important, but uh, uh, a good guideline in two four-pole machines, I think a lot of inverter uh, motor design experts would agree that the bar numbers should be 80% uh, of the stator slots or eight or more poles, the bar number should be 120% of the stator slots. For higher pole numbers, you need more bars. That's a well-known, that that's a rule you should mark down. Uh, and, and then, of course, never have the exact same of bar numbers as you have stator slots. Never, never, never. Uh, my guideline, what I use, is somewhere between five and seven bars per pole. Because 
if you if you look at the end of a of a rotor the uh for uh all the north poles the the current is flowing by definition let's say it, it flows uh uh into the into the diagram into the paper into the drawing and all the south poles the current flows out of the drawing well so so the current flow of those uh, bars produces the flux that produces the poles in the rotor but but the but the uh, rotor poles aren't glued there they're they're slipping so that the uh, the specific bars that have the current going in one direction versus the ones going the other direction is changing right at the pole transitions right at the the plus and minus current transitions so they're they're changing all the time so the current is actually reversing in in one bar between the the two the two poles all the time as it rotates in accordance with the slip so uh so so you you want a sufficient number of current carrying conductors in parallel there between that to properly define a, a pole and make sure it looks sinusoidal that's uh, that's the only way i know to explain it to give you a feel for why uh, uh, a high number of bar a reasonable number of bars is required uh now now with respect to nema frame motors standard stuff have been built for years and this is a chart that's provided by uh, uh either reliance or baldor but they're all the same company now and they're owned by abb but but here's a list of uh uh nema ac induction motors that were all originally designed for grid power and you'll notice that uh, there's they're listed by horsepower and number of poles and then the stator slot and rotor bar number combinations listed there for your information uh there notice that uh some of these are high efficient and premium efficiency motors so they so as efficiency went up they changed some of these not all of them but some of them you can study those it's interesting uh so so the motors that induction motors that are grid powered have their own set of rules i list them here i don't think they have a lot to do with inverter driven motors but uh uh, uh, uh there's a, there's another list of rules that's given by dr cyril vinot in his priceless book the theory and design of small induction motors it's a very famous set of rules his friend uh uh tricky phil tricky had his set of rules either and and some of these rules are such that they uh if you follow one rule you violate another that's what but but that's all related to uh, grid motors and you don't have to worry about it so much with uh with uh inverter driven motors my guideline is to use five to seven bars per pole for grid motors i think it's simple that concludes this lecture thank you very much